Welcome to the Shun Podcast, where we expose religions that use shunning as a tool to control people. Today we have a story that's a little bit different than the norm. Uh, we're going to get to know a guy named Dave Warnock. He's a former pastor, a member of a charismatic evangelical Pentecostal church, who is actually shunned by his children. But the story is bigger than that. Dave has also been diagnosed in the past few months with ALS, uh, sometimes more commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease, and he knows that he only has a finite amount of time left in his life. This is a truly inspiring story, and we talk about a subject that few really want to talk about, which is death. Uh, more than that, we talk about life, as death isn't as scary as never truly living. Dave mentions a poem during the interview, and if you stick around after the interview, I'm going to read that to you. So without further ado, let's go ahead and meet Dave. I'm interviewing Dave Warnock, um, and now Dave, you were a member of a Pentecostal church, correct? Yes. All right, and um, how old are you today, and how long have you been out of that, uh, of that church? I, I'm 63. And I was in that particular church about 15 years, yeah, 14, okay. 15 years. But prior to that, I was uh, in my, my life uh, from the age of 18 on, I was in various uh, charismatic slash evangelical Pentecostal type churches. Okay, so, um, so you were raised then around religion? Was that not really? No, no really. I came, I came to it uh, as a teenager after high school, or rather suddenly and abruptly, in the Jesus movement in the seventies that was sweeping the country, and I got caught up in that. Oh, okay. What kind of drew you to that movement in particular? My older brother influenced me. He was away at college and got saved, radically saved, and and baptized with the Holy Spirit, as we called it, and he became real radical. Um, preacher of the gospel and he began to work on me as you know faithful followers would do you witness sure. to your friends and family and so i got caught up in it as well and and often off i was off i was for the next three and a half decades yeah it's, you know it just takes a moment and it, it ends up taking a lot of your life uh that, it sure does that comes from that so what did your parents think or your family think when they saw you kind of getting into this radical, you know, this Jesus movement that was going on. Uh, they thought it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I was pretty, you know, you, you go from just being a normal 18, 17, 18 year old to uh, going to Bible studies, wearing a big cross around your neck, carrying a big 20 pound Bible, um, you know, doing all this stuff, saying hallelujah, every, every other word and thank you, Jesus, every other word. And, you know, you just become this, this freak. Uh, back we were called Jesus freaks, you know, that was yeah. kind of a, a badge of honor that we wore. Um, did you, so, you know, that's a big time in your life when you're around that age, you know, being around 18, did you, did you also, um, I, I don't know what the culture was then, but did you go to college or did you just well, fully immerse yourself? Well, I was planning yourself? to, I, this was just after I got out of high school, I was planning to go to college and kind of had an idea I wanted to be a sports writer, but I didn't have a lot of clear direction on how to get there. I didn't have the money for it. I didn't have anybody really directing me. And so I just thought I'd sit out a year and make some money and and then uh, save some money and go to college. And I just kind of was floundering. I look back on it now with more clarity than I had then. But I was kind of floundering and just didn't have a lot of direction. And and, and so I was, I was quite vulnerable yeah. for someone to come along and say, hey, we've got the answers. It's in this book. Follow us, do what we say, and you'll be great. Everything will be, everything's mapped out for you. God has a plan for your life. Just do this, and it's all going to be great. And that was very, that was a very enticing message for a vulnerable 18-year-old. Sure. You're vulnerable. You're feeling a little out of control. And then here somebody comes and says that they have all the answers. So, Jesus is the answer. That's right. Yeah. It's all-encompassing. Yeah. And so, I bought into it. Hook, line, and sinker. I dove in. I didn't tiptoe in. I dove in all the way. <laughs> I was off and running. <laughs> so you were a true follower then. Oh, yeah. So how did the church that you, let's say the one that you jumped into when you were 18, how did that make you see the world around you? Well, it wasn't even a church. It was a youth Bible, not even a Bible study, just a youth gathering that we, okay. my brother took me to one night and, and it was this electric meeting of 
30 or 40 young people crammed into a living room and there wasn't even a church associated with it. So we even looked kind of with disdain at the churches, like they just weren't fired up. They weren't as excited for Jesus as we were. So we would go to churches and we'd come in there and we'd sit on the pews and we'd be the Jesus freaks and all the old people in the church would look at us like we were crazy because we were. <laughs> and and we just kind of bopped around like this bag of ragamuffin uh, gypsies for Jesus. And so we really didn't have a home church and didn't have a pastor. It was just wild. And then and then I did get associated with churches along the way and began to become a lay leader and Bible teacher and worship leader and all that stuff through the years. And then was ordained into one of the churches and, you know, never went to a seminary because in that movement, you just kind of have to be called by God. So I began to see the world through the lens of the Bible. To, to me, the Bible was everything. And, and so I took it literally. I believed it was inspired word of God and that it was written by God. He whispered into the Bible writers and they wrote down what he told them to write down. And it was all literal word of God. So I, I lived, I lived it that way. I, I, you know, just was all in. Yeah. So how did you see people on the outside of what you were doing? I mean, like I grew up Jehovah's Witnesses, so everyone on the outside was worldly. They were doomed. Uh, you know, they, they weren't to be associated with really, did you, were you insular like that or how did you yeah. see the world and other people? Well, to, uh, actually you guys were a cult. Oh, us, absolutely. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, absolutely. We, we had the truth and you guys were just so lost. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, you got uh, that right. <laughs> we were, a yeah, cult. but I, I, what I didn't realize is I was in a cult too. It's just a yeah. bigger one. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, I viewed the world as lost and, yeah. and if people didn't have a solid relationship with Jesus, they were doomed and we needed to help them get saved. That's why I didn't ever go to college because I was, I took it seriously. I thought Jesus was coming back next week or next month. Mm -hmm. And we had serious work to do. I, I did street preaching. I ran uh, coffee houses, um, Bible studies. I was doing everything I could to influence the people around me. I carried a little uh, new Testament in my pocket at work, trying to instigate conversations with people. I was annoying as hell. <laughs> and uh, and so I was, you know, very seriously trying to make, uh, not pay, make, but influence people into following Jesus like I like I did. And they had to do it like I did, because sure. if you didn't have the Holy Spirit, you weren't fully, you didn't have the full power of God. You could be saved, but you're, you're missing out on so much if you don't have the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. You don't speak in tongues. You don't do prophecy. You don't do healing. So we looked at everyone else as a little bit less than us in that sense. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that you brought up the whole kind of the doomsday concept there, you know, that the, the end is coming any day now, because that's, uh, you know, that's something that we grew up with in, yeah. in the witnesses, um, that, that urgency that you've got to go out and talk to people now because the end is coming. Um, did you all believe in just typical heaven and hell, or did you have something else that you were no, going for? Yeah. Pretty much the standard issue, heaven and hell, gotcha. you know, uh, burn it. Heaven's a blissful eternity of floating on clouds and singing Hosanna. And when you stop to analyze that, it sounded boring as hell. Yes. Um, but then hell was a burning forever, torment, the white weeping and gnashing of teeth, the worm dieth not. All that stuff was hell. So there was no middle ground. You either believed in Jesus and accepted him as your personal savior and your your works were as filthy rags, so it didn't matter how good you were. You had to be born again, and if if you weren't, then you were you were doomed to hell. I, I'm sorry you're having to go there. I have compassion on you. I'm not I'm not gleeful about it, but it's it's too bad that's where you're going. Yeah, it's just it's just factual. So it kind of yeah. removes some of that emotion. Yeah, the no emotion to it. Right. So how did your I guess did you. Should I, is the correct word career? How did your career pr play out as far yeah, as no, in, in the it's, church? It's not really a career. I uh, I was at different times on staff at churches. Other times I had my own business or I had a job. I was kind of all over the place. Gotcha. But I, I was always involved in leadership of some sort. I wasn't a pew sitter. I didn't just kind of go to church. You know, I was very involved. My family, I did. I was very serious about discipling my children. We got, I was married at the age of 23, so about five years in as a Christian. Um, you know, in that in that world, if you really want to have sex, you better get married because you can't have sex outside marriage. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> so that's why we marry young. Yes. Um, 
but no, I, I treated it very seriously. I raised three kids. They were all, you know, I wanted them to, to be discipled in the Lord. We were very serious about uh, all of it. And so, um, but I was almost always involved in some form of leadership, whether I was professional or paid staff or um, an associate pastor or a Bible study teacher, small group leaders, a men's, men's ministry leader, just the gamut. Gotcha. Did you ever pastor your own church fully or? I did in the last season. Funny. Uh, actually, there was a couple of seasons when I was an associate and I actually ran the church while he was on sabbatical the pastor. Um, but then the last season of it, I was an associate, but I was given um, responsibility for a congregation that was what they called a satellite congregation. And I was put in charge of that to pastor it. So I was doing all the stuff that you would as a pastor of any church. And it was about a 250, 200 people church, the satellite that I had. So, um, yeah, I preached every Sunday and did the counseling and staff meetings and all that stuff. Gotcha. So did you, your, you said that you have your wife and your kids in it. Did, did it spread throughout your family anymore or was it pretty much your nuclear family? Uh, no, my, my mom actually, uh, has had come around at some point. I'm not really sure what the transition of her life was, but as a, as a, a, a child and teenager, she was not religious at all. We were, our home was kind of a religious vacuum. It wasn't anti or wasn't pro. It was just zero flat. And um, somewhere along the line in her later life, her 60s, 70s, whatever, she got very fervent in her faith. And she's now a little prayer warrior. She's 85 years old. And she's, a, uh, you know, she's really, really torn up about me that I'm going to hell. And she praying for me all the time and wants me to come back to God and all those things. Sure, of course. And your wife, um, when you met her, did you meet her in the movement or did, uh, was she, yeah. she, you did? Okay. Yeah. I was at a, a summer youth camp that I was a counselor at a Christian, Christian youth camp. And she was a counselor there. I was a counselor there. She was from, I was living in Arkansas at the time and she was in Tennessee here where I live now. And she was there for the summer to be a counselor. And I met her there. Okay. And so you, you've got all this, you, the religion has started to, you know, even branch out, like you said, in your family a little bit. I don't know, how many kids did you have? Three. Three, three kids. And um, they were all in as well. So you know, I know that in the end, you ended up leaving the church. Why? What was it that started to open your eyes? I know that, at least for most that wake up at, in where I come from, it's not typically, you know, just one event, but it's a no. series of things yeah. that starts to open your eyes. So, so kind of what was your progression as far as going from this, this person that seems to be the, you know, the true believer that's definitely all in and that's raising their family in this, what started uh, opening those cracks up for you? Yeah, you're, you know, you're right. It's, it's a death by a, a thousand cuts, mm -hmm. as, as others have said, and it's just one cut here and you bleed a little, another cut, you so over the years, you kind of have a doubt about this and it's something else doesn't add up and you see this happen and where's God in that? And you kind of go, hmm. And then you push it aside or you get busy and you just tamp it down. It's like a whack-a-mole game. You whack that mole down and it pops up somewhere else. But um, in this last church I was in, this Pentecostal church where the shunning took place, I was on staff, like I said, and had been working about a year on staff there and was in charge of the satellite church. And the pastor was very controlling as you have to be to practice that sort of thing and manipulative and narcissistic and all those things. And he and I just really clashed. And um, I, I, I knew we would go in, but I just wanted to serve and I wanted to, to do what I could, you know? And so anyway, I thought, I thought I could handle it. I was wrong. Uh, so we clashed bad and he was, he was always, he always had it out for me and he was always calling me into meetings and we, you know, I was, I was doing this and I was doing that. I wasn't doing this and I wasn't doing that. It just got exhausting. And meanwhile, the church I was pastoring was flourishing. It grew from like 50 people to 250 in a year. Wow. And, you know, it was just exploding. And, and I, But I wasn't doing it right, according to him. So anyway, eventually he fired me because he called me. I was, he told me I was too independent. I wasn't doing things uh, according to the script. And I wasn't being a team player and all those things. And, you know, hell I was, you know, I was independent. I, 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 guilty as charged, but 
So when I was fired, um, I was still a believer at the time and still really much calling on God for help. That's what led to the shunning because my daughters were married to men who were in their intern program to become pastors in the church. And they were all sold in and he really went hard after me and turned them against me and, and insinuated all kinds of things that weren't true and and essentially put them in the position, my daughters and their husbands, of having to choose between their dad and God. Mm. Uh, because in those environments, the, the pastor is presented as such an authority figure that he represents God, in essence, is God. So they were put in a position of having to do that. And their practice in those positions, when a family member was rebellious or out of line, they shunned them. You know, they taught them to, that you turn over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh and the spirit can be saved. And and that's that's the essence of what he, he felt like he was doing. And so when one of Jehovah's Witnesses is going to get shunned, there's a there's a judicial process internally and there's announcements made from the platform and then everyone knows to shun you. So how did it go for you? What was the, was there any sort of process or was it just everybody kind of ghosted you or how? Yeah, it's, discussions? Kind of a, it's kind of an internal thing. I don't, I don't recall there ever being anything from the platform, but it, it was a definite, uh, you can't see them. You can't talk to them. If you see them in public, you look away. Um, and, and they have to, the shunned person, me, let's use me, I have to repent in the proper way mm -hmm. and use the proper words. And when I do it well enough and, and it's been accepted, then they, they literally will tell you, we've accepted your repentance and we're going to recommend that you, your kids restore relationship to you. I was literally told that wow. by them. And so it's it's very um, specific in terms of how you have to do things to to earn back the relationship that has been lost. And this was with your your kids. What about with your wife? Did that? I mean, was she they under any her, pressure? They shunned her because she was connected with me, and wow. and so they shunned us both. Wow. And so what we did is after. I don't know how long of that we left that church, obviously, because we were still there, but just not, you know, they fired me, but they wanted me to stay around because they literally told us the healing is in the house. So they wanted us to stay members of that church, even though my kids were still there and going there and were shunning us, but they still wanted us to go to church there. So it's a little different. We're not turned out like you guys are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, if we wanted to, go back that we would have to go back and be in that shunned environment uh for a period of time but yeah for us once they're done with us they're they're done with us until we come back and do a whole lot of things yeah um but uh, you know it is there is like this this um shunning by association you know that your your wife had to go through as well um how did that impact your relationship i mean that has to be a difficult like does she blame you or it has to be a difficult thing well externally she did and internally she probably did because here's what happened after after a couple of i don't know how long of that uh maybe a couple of years because what happened is as that was going on i began to question god where are you why aren't you helping me in this mm -hmm. i've been serving you and doing what i can and my kids are lost and i can't have my kids and my grandkids i had a couple of grandkids at the time and and that began me on my journey toward uh questioning the validity of the whole thing at the time we went to we just went to a different church and we were doing all the things we always did small groups prayer ministry all the stuff so we just kind of slipped over started again and thought okay well i'll try to do it here but all as that began to as this drug on for some time, I really began to question everything, and that's what eventually led me out of Christianity altogether. And just about the time I was beginning to make inroads with my kids again, <laughs> and they were beginning to accept me and her back into some sort of tenuous, awkward relationship, because it's never the same after that. No. Ever? No, it I can't, can't see it, it. No, it can't ever be the same. Mm -mm. So it was tenuous. It was awkward. There were a few little uh, stabs at, at trying to get together, and it was just awful. And and about that time, I was I was losing my ability to believe anymore. 
And then when I realized I didn't didn't believe at all and that I was simply an agnostic, possibly an atheist, I had to tell my kids again, okay, here we go. I've got to be honest with you. I don't believe this stuff. I've lost all my, and that is when they turned again and said, okay, dad, well, we can't be in relationship with, we cannot be in relationship with you or mom because she's staying married to you. This pastor literally told, teaches that a woman should leave her husband if he, if he leaves the faith. Hmm. Where's so, that in the Bible? <laughs> yeah. Good luck finding that one. Yeah. So that's what led us. I mean, and then that went on. Well, it goes on to this day. Um, and that's been about, uh, that was 2011. This has been about eight years. And so uh, because, you know, in a long time we're having grandkids. We've got six grandkids now. But after five years of that or so, and us neither one having any of that, and year after year you're going through Christmas and birthdays and Mother's Days and Father's Days and all the days, and it just wore us out. It wore me out, and it, it essentially – led to the, to the breakup of the marriage, and I left a couple of years ago, and since I have, uh, she's back in relationship with them, and she's got her daughters back, she's got her grandkids back, and I knew that would happen. I felt like it would, uh, that if I got out of the way, they could all share life again together because they all believe the same way, and just I didn't believe. My wife kept her faith. Yeah, that puts you in a really bad position. Yeah. Um, did she go back to the church that you were originally shunned from? No, 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 no. Oh, she could never. Wondering. She could never go back there. Okay. In fact, in fact, my daughters don't either. One of them, interestingly enough, uh, uh, my older daughter, her husband, they were in the congregation I was pastoring, the satellite congregation, mm -hmm. with me, serving as youth pastor and worship leader, and they took over the church when I was fired. So my son-in-law began to do the job I was doing. And he was able to do that for four or five years, which he did. And then he ran afoul of this um, narcissistic pastor. And he they left last year and went to Florida. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, no one can stay there long. It, it's just that toxic. Yeah. And, you know, the narcissism is typically something you're going to find in anything that starts to get culty. <laughs> yeah, always. Always going to be the narcissist somewhere in there. Um, so you've been shunned now for for roughly eight years. Yeah. Um, and have you had any, con have you ever been able to have any contact like with your grandkids or anything? No, I've, I've spent uh, when in that little window of opportunity we had after the firing and before I lost my faith, there were a couple of instances where we were around her. And then as other grandkids came, there were there's these little weird windows that popped up here and there, like we'd be at a funeral or, or something and they'd be there and we'd all just act like everything was normal. They would talk to me. So it wasn't classic shunning at that point. Yeah. It was just dissociation and a bro broken fellowship, yeah. a broken relationship. I hate to use the word fellowship. It's triggering. Yeah, um, I can understand that. Yeah. But, uh, so it wasn't classic shunning. It was just this weird thing. So we'd be at a funeral that happened twice in one year. And my daughters would be around. A couple of grandkids would be there. We'd hang out. We'd do things that families do at those situations. You'd talk like everything's normal. And then you wouldn't see them again for a year or six months. And there's no phone contact. There's no relationship whatsoever. It's just this distance. And and, and then another time you'd see them, it would be, hey, well, how you doing, Daddy? It was the strangest thing. It's like you're living in Twilight Zone. Yeah, I, I understand. When my dad went into hospice about six Six months after my wife and I became shunned officially, um, I was allowed to go see him one last time in hospice. I wasn't invited to the funeral, but I was allowed to do that. Wow. And uh, it was a really, it was a really weird experience to suddenly see that family again. And of course, just like you said, everybody acts like everything's cool, and you just talk like you always did. But then, as soon as I left hospice, I knew that you know that was it. I'm never going to see these thing, people. It? It's yeah. the strangest thing. It's so surreal. You can't wrap your head around it. Yeah, and I don't I don't know about you, but I actually regret on a level going and doing that because it it was um it, it was it doesn't sit well mentally or emotionally to 
go back into that situation and then to it's like being re-traumatized being shunned again as soon as you leave it, it was a it really a, is it's i awful. thought about that too the second time i saw my daughters uh, my older daughter had two of her kids there so i hung out with my grandkids went down to the creek rode in the golf cart with them you know just had an afternoon of normal grandpa time uh with hang out with my daughters ate meals you know yeah uh, and then toward the end of the afternoon i started getting this feeling like okay, this is really weird, and this is going to be really hard to come down off of this. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to, I told my wife, I said, I'm, I'm going to go home now. I'm, I'm, I need to get out of here. And I just slipped out the door, didn't say goodbye or anything, yeah. and and drove home and about an hour and a half away. And I thought, okay, I, I don't know when I'll see them again, if ever. And in fact, I'm not mistaken that maybe the last time I've seen either one of my daughters, and that was uh, four years ago, probably. Yeah, it's not it's not much of a relationship if you only see each other when other people die, or yeah, I mean, so yeah. that's just a it's a horrible way to live, and and it's it's not fair for you to be jerked in and out of their life. Um, that's just not... yeah, no, it's it's so weird. It's just such a weird way to do life, and it's inhumane and 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 at some level immoral yeah i know i i agree so how has shunning impacted you um other than you you talked about examining your faith through you know in the process of it but just personally how how has shunning impacted you has it had any um or what effects has it had let's say well early on in my deconversion life or my new life, you know, as I started waking up to the reality, I no longer believed in God. And I didn't really, I was trying to figure out how to identify myself and and who am I and all those things we go through. Um, I I kind of soft sold the idea. I, I, you know, I I didn't call myself an an atheist. I kind of used the word agnostic. Mm -hmm. If someone asked me, because I I was trying to be careful not to continue continue to alienate, alienate them more. I thought if I tiptoed around a little bit, it might be a little more palatable for them to, to process the idea of reconnecting. And, and every now and then I'd make attempts to reconnect and I would call them or email them or something and ask them if there's any way. And, you know, I'd either get ignored or they'd tell me we're, we can't. Uh, so it caused me to kind of, um, modify myself a bit more than I think I would have if I hadn't had that going on. Uh, because at this point, I, I'm i I'm not afraid to call myself an atheist. It simply means atheist. I don't believe in a God. Yeah. It's, it's that simple. And, and, and it's not a bad word, and I want to take the stigma off of it. I want to do my part to take the stigma off of the word atheist. It, it, you know, <laughs> When yeah. someone says atheist, they look at you like you have you're Satan and you have horns coming out of your head. <laughs> yes, I, I get that all the time, and I understand the stigma. <laughs> so I'd like to I'd like to chip away at that as well. So I've become a lot more bold about that, and and uh, a lot less concerned about what people think about me or or say about me, and including my kids. Yeah, and how about this? I I assume. It, is there a, a freedom, a, a new freedom of some sort to your life that has come through this journey? Yeah, the freedom really started, and, and no disrespect to my ex-wife or anybody, but I, I was living a real, mis- I had a real miserable existence as that dissociation with my kids drug on and the disconnect with my wife because she was a believer and I was And we, we didn't share a lot in common, and there was no point of connection there in terms of of things that really mattered and how we view the world and what we thought was important or right or wrong. You know, it's, it's hard for me to do life with someone who, who believes at their core that, that gay people are sinful. It's, it's just hard for me to, to be connected to someone at that level. I found it more and more difficult as the years went on. So I felt I was living a little bit of a hidden life and not being able to fully be myself. And so my freedom really, blossomed when I left the marriage and rebooted my life and started over um, a little over two years ago. And and that's when I be, felt like I began to feel comfortable in my own skin and feel be honest with myself and with everyone else around me. And I didn't, I didn't hide the fact that I was an atheist. I wasn't ashamed of it. Uh, I, I wasn't 
flaunting it. I didn't like wear a big A badge and walk outside, but <laughs> I just letter. didn't. I right. I didn't shirk it. I didn't. I, I you know, if somebody asked me, "Hey, where do you go to church?" I just simply say, "I don't go to church. I don't believe in God." And you know, you, after they get off the shocked expression off their face and then back away slowly from you, um, you realize it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Um, so you talked about, so you said that at the beginning of the interview, I think you said you were 63 years old. I am now. Yes. Okay. And so this would have been, you know, 60, 61 when you're making this life change. And I just, Oh yeah. I think it's, um, I just, I always admire people who aren't afraid to make a change, you know, no matter, you know, people have the, the sunk cost fallacy and, and yeah, a lot yeah. of times it keeps them stuck in a place and they're afraid to examine. You know, I've known people um, who who really had a lot of doubts in different religions, but it was that, you know, well, you know, if I if I leave this, then I lose my friends or my family yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But at some point. It's just not healthy to live an inauthentic life. Oh, I agree completely, Mike. It's just the worst thing ever. Yeah. Uh, you got to look in the mirror every day and, and, and realize you're being honest with yourself and that you, with the people in your lives that you're, you know, what I love about, and I have a lot of friends, by the way, oh, awesome. in, the athe- in the atheist community who are ex-Christians. I mean, that's the core of the people I spend the bulk of my time with. And, and we all have that in common. It's kind of the thing that's brought us together. But a lot of them I know either locally here or nationwide through uh, private Facebook groups and other connected sources um, who, who can't live out in the open because there are people in their families that don't know. and They're afraid of what might happen if they know. And they kind of have to hide it here and hide it there. And, you know, we call it coming out. I think you may have I heard that in terms of sure. re- religious deconversion expression, much like a gay person has to. And they always have to worry about who hears this and who hears that and who who knows this and who knows that. And what can I say around this person? What can I say around that person? And to be able to live life in complete freedom where you don't have to worry about who hears anything you say. You're the same person in every single environment, whether you're with a family member or in a group or with a friend. Yeah. And all the all the friends that I have, quite a few friends that are, I call them my holdover friends from my Christian days who are still Christians, but they still accept me exactly for who I am. I can talk, I can use the, I can drop all the F bombs I want and they don't worry about it. And I can be who I am. I can say what I want to say. And I'm not unkind or I don't go around bashing Christians or bashing religion. I hate it. I'll be honest because it, it causes a lot of damage in the world, but I don't go out of my way to, go at Christians and say, you got to change. You're an idiot. You're stupid. How can you believe that stuff? If someone engages me in a conversation, I will have an intelligent conversation with them, but I'm not going out of my my way trying to deconvert Christians. So I've got good friends who consider themselves Christians, but we're able to have friendships because they allow me to be who I am and I allow them to be who they are. And it works. Yeah. I'm friends with people Politically, who run the far right? Well, maybe not the far, far, far right. Oh, but the far yeah. right and the far left. You know, yeah. I, I'm friends with people who are religious and people who are atheists, and it, we're all just people. Why? Why should exactly. one part of us uh, identi- be our identification? Um, well, hopefully, should, we're more it, complex than that. It, and, and if we strip away religious dogma, I'll use that word. Mm-hmm. If we strip away that then we are just humans connecting with one another. Yeah. We're just individual people connecting as human beings. And we all have faults and failures and, and good and bad in us. And we're all mixed and, and, and there's, we're not binary. We're, we're complex. We're layered. Uh, and so if we can just allow each other to be that, we don't have to, we don't have the wars and the conflicts that we have now. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> if we could accept each other's differences and, and just let people be people, it would change the world. And religion has done more in the history of mankind to foster that kind of conflict than anything I can think of. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there there's always an us, so there has to be a them. Absolutely. There's, always, there's right and the wrong, black yes. and white. Yes, absolutely. So now, were you a part of the, I think I 
maybe remember, were you part of the clergy project? I was. Uh huh. Can you, for the uninformed listener, can you kind of, what is the clergy project? How'd you get involved in it? What it mean to you? Yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a great outfit. Um, it, it was formed for, for clergy who have lost their belief in a God. And so what that means is it can be clergy past or present. So it's it's an online forum. It's a private, very secret group. You have to be interviewed to get into it. You can't just join it. And it's it's done so to protect the people within it because there literally are clergy who are still serving in the pulpit who don't believe in God, but they're trapped there because they're trying to find another way to make a living or, or they're afraid of family members knowing or whatever the reasons are. Mm-hmm. And I was actually on the board of that until just a few months ago. Um, but it's a great, uh, in fact, that's where I first became connected with some other former Christians because I, I found out about it somehow. I don't recall how, but when I, when I lost my faith, I did not know anyone that had been through that. I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know where to go. I was floundering. I felt very much alone. I felt like I'd lost my mind. And I didn't know who to talk to about it. So I found some clergy project members, got their numbers somehow, made some phone calls and started finding my way into communities of people who've been through the same thing as me. Yeah, that's an amazing feeling. <laughs> it really you, is. When you finally find your people again. Um, it's funny that you said that, or I guess I hadn't thought about there being current pastors who are preaching from the pulpit who maybe don't have belief. That's in the in the witness community, we call that being PIMO, physically in, mentally out. <laughs> that's <laughs> so, funny. So that's the term. There there are a lot of PIMOs who are sitting in congregations who don't believe any of it, but they know that if they leave, they'll be shunned, they'll lose their family, yeah. maybe their business or whatever. And uh, so for now, they they stay in the, yeah. because of the pressure. Um, well, I was lucky I didn't have to deal with that kind of conflict internally because it is an internal conflict to, to be doing that. You feel inauthentic. You yeah. feel like a fraud, but you, you you feel trapped and you're afraid. And I've talked to quite a few ministers who are just so miserable and afraid and panicky about what to do. And and I was lucky in that I was already a non-believer. Uh, I mean, I was already out of ministry and working in my insurance business. Um, before I lost my faith, so I didn't have to navigate that. Yeah, because for a lot of a lot of pastors are are not bivocational, are they? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, that is a very. I I find this fascinating. Um, I I know some of my listeners will as well because. I think one of the things when you're in a cult and and you you're not given perspectives or you don't know what goes on in other religions, you think you're the only one. But yeah, uh, you know, one of the reasons I do this podcast and bring people of different groups on is we weren't alone. There are other people going through the same or very similar things, just with a different label attached. It's important to know that too. Yeah, it is. It really is. It's it's very eye opening. Yeah, uh, to see the similarities. So. Um, so where are you at now in life? What, what, what are you, are you passionate about or? Well, the, I don't know if you, uh, have the full scope of what I'm doing right now and why I'm uh, doing so many podcasts, but mm-hmm. a couple of months ago, I was diagnosed with ALS with Lou Gehrig's disease. Yeah. And so because of that, I retired from my work I was doing and I moved out of my apartment in with some friends and. I just kind of lightened my load and I've gotten myself in position to travel as much as I can, spend as much as time as I can with people that I care about. And, and I'm talking a lot about how, how to live your best life and grab the moments in life that you can, because you know, if you don't, then life's going to be over before you know it. So that's a lot of what I'm, uh, for lack of a better term, the message I'm, I'm promoting now is, is that kind of thing. So, yeah, I did know that, uh, you know, just from the emails exchanges we had had a little bit right. about that. And I find it, it's a fascinating topic. Um, so, and, and this is not, to, this is totally not to compare what we went through to with what you're going through currently, but, uh, or not to say that it's the same in any way, but for Jehovah's Witnesses, we were always taught that we would never die. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we were taught that 
you know, I was never supposed to drive a car. The world was going to end but before I was 16. Wow. And I, I was going to walk right into a paradise earth. So when I woke up and I left the cult at 38 years old, <laughs> and I know this sounds, this sounds so stupid in, in retrospect, but for the first time in my life, it's like somebody told me I was going to die because I, I never even considered it. Wow. That's crazy. I, I, I didn't think it. And a yeah. lot of people who leave Jehovah's witnesses really struggle with the concept. I was going to ask you that does, does it make you very, does it make the people that, that were, that were taught that from birth, does it make you just uh, terrified of death? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I bet. Um, so I really struggled for a while, literally every night right? when I would lay my head on the pillow. And finally, you know, my brain was starting to go silent. All of a sudden, I would worry about whether or not I would wake up tomorrow and mm -hmm. and worry in almost a panicky way. Um, it, it was uh, fairly intense. Um, were you taught the concept of heaven and hell that you that if if since you left did you were you afraid at some point that no so, you were going to go to hell no so okay so we were going to either live in this paradise earth yeah or we're just dead where we go I back see. to the dirt we no longer okay. exist there's no hell right okay. and honestly that's what I believe now you know that yeah, when, when, that when I die right. <laughs> yeah right right but that was actually the punishment so uh, even though missing even, out on paradise even though it's yeah so there's the fomo the fear of missing out of paradise but there's also which I don't have anymore because I don't believe in any paradise but when you've been told that just going back to the earth is a punishment your whole life it's also hard to disconnect that when you realize that that might be your, that is going to be your eventuality. Yeah. Um, and hard to disconnect that it's a punishment or just the negative connotations that have always surrounded that. So right. it's, it's got its own really messed up and twisted layers for us. And when, you know, I, I heard this and, and saw in the email exchange a little bit about what you wanted to talk about, it is a subject that fascinates me how people deal with it, especially right. people in the atheist community. And, right. you know, you can kind of speak as a person who was once a person of, of faith. But, yeah. But is not that's what I'm doing a lot. I'm talking about the, the, uh, uh, the conflict, uh, in the difference in, in how I'm seeing the reactions from my Christian family and friends, as opposed to my atheist family uh, friends, um, and and it's just a it's a startling contrast. And I'm also talking about how I view death now as an atheist, as opposed to how I viewed it as a Christian. And to summarize, what I see with a lot of Christians, and I won't generalize and say all Christians, but sure. with a lot of Christians, uh, and I'm talking when I say Christians, I want to make sure that people understand. I'm not talking about the vast array of Christian expression, which can be anything from Roman Catholic, Episcopal, uh, Methodist, down to the snake handling Pentecostals. I mean, you know, runs the gamut. It's a wide spectrum. Right. I'm talking about evangelicalism, which uh, treats the Bible as the word of God and, and believes in a literal heaven and hell and, and born again, uh, sin and repentance, those kinds of things. You have to be saved and all those things. So that's the expression that I was in. That's the expression I talk about when I talk about Christianity. Just so that people say, well, not my faith. They're not, you know. <laughs> Hashtag that, not my faith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that wasn't me. Okay. Well, then I'm not talking to you. Fine. Right, right. Um, so what I find is that there, if you really, I mean, that theology teaches that when you die, you just go to heaven. And you may wait somewhere. There's a lot of various vague interpretations of different biblical passages. But the essence of the story is that after death, you end up in heaven or paradise or in waiting, but eventually get to heaven and that's where you stay forever. So death is not really a thing. It's a, it, the Bible says it's mm. the last, the last enemy. So the last enemy that shall be defeated is death. So the Bible teaches it, teaches that it's an enemy. So if you brought a Bible believing Christian, you view it in such a negative light that it's just the enemy. And, you know, I point out too, that people say Jesus died for my sins. Well, no, he really didn't. 
he was he was he had a bad weekend, uh, but then he got up and went to heaven. Well, yeah, and how is it in them <laughs> in a similar vein? If you die and you immediately go to heaven, didn't you so even what? beat Jesus this time? <laughs> exactly. So you know, I, I'm sorry if I'm not all emotional about Jesus dying for my sins, but he really did. It. He's mm-hmm. still alive, so he's not dead. Right. But anyway, the, you know, the whole resurrection of the dead, and, and if you're an unbeliever, you go to hell. If you're a believer, you go to heaven. So so death is not really a thing. It's just like a doorway, just like a tunnel that you drive through. You know, I was on a, a highway the other day, and I went through a tunnel of about 30 seconds. That's kind of like death. You know, you're in this tunnel, and then you come out on the other side, and, you you know, the road, the road wise, and you either go right into heaven or left into hell. And, um, and so... When they're looking at someone like me, who's staring death in the face, they really don't know what to do with it. And and so they tell me they're praying for me. And I want to ask them, which I haven't because I'm not an unkind person, but I want to ask them, what are you praying exactly? Are you praying? It's got to be one of two things, either that God will heal me, which will be the first time in the history of the disease that's ever happened. Right. Or two, that I repent and return to God before I die and go to hell. I, I have to believe it's the, the latter. But nonetheless, they don't know how to get into it with me. They don't know how to come around me and say, Dave, we love you. We're here for you. I, I'm so sorry about this. My heart's broken. Um, I'd love to hang out with you. I want to spend as much time with you as I can. Uh, they're not doing that. And and it's it's their silence is is loud. Yeah. Whereas my atheist friends are all up in my business and they are coming around, they're calling, they're texting, they're coming by, they want to hang out. They're, they're saying, I don't have words. My heart is broken. I love you. I want to be with you. We want to be there with you at the end. I, tell me what you need. They're all present with me. And it's amazing the difference I've seen. And I have to think it's because of the fear of death, period. You say it's because of the fear. Oh, because death has been made to be an enemy. Exactly. And well, now, how been... much of an enemy could it be, though, if it's so temper- If as soon as you die, you go to heaven? Why would that be your enemy? That's what boggles my mind. I don't understand it. Yeah, that they doesn't would, make sense. You'd think they'd be in a hurry. Yeah. Let's get this over with. Whoop, whoop. Let's go. But when you when you kind of live a life where you're looking forward to you know heaven or a paradise or whatever the reward is going to be, this life currently just really doesn't have that much meaning. That's exactly it. You but when you real, yeah, when yeah. you realize when you're an atheist and you realize this is what we've got, and I don't care who you are, this is all we can prove we've got. This is all we know we have. So exactly. why would you not maximize it? <laughs> that's my point, and that's been the gist of what I've been talking about. And people have asked me, "Well, are you afraid of dying? Are you, you know?" And, and I say, "No, I'm not. I, 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 I'll go to sleep and I won't wake up." And that's not all bad. You know, I love sleep. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but am I afraid of, of what's after? No, because I don't think anything's after. And if there is something after, I'll deal with that when I get there. But right now, we don't know what that is. And so right now, my my focus is live this life. Live it hard. Live it well. Do everything you can do. Don't say no when you can say yes. If there's something you think, ah, I should do that, I'd like to do that, but maybe another time, no, do it. Do it now. Yeah. Do it now. Do it with all your heart. Maximize the moments. Grab every moment in life that you can. The thing that I I, I talk about a lot, this is a maxim I live by. When I rebooted my life at the age of 61 and, and, and came up... I spent some time at the beach, uh, just re, you know, refiguring everything, reconfiguring, as the old ad used to say. Um, and I was kind of saying, okay, what's life going to look like? And and starting over at, at such an uh, old age, mm-hmm. um, I realized this one thing: that life is a collection of moments. There's no big scheme. There's no big plan. There's no thing that we're we're supposed to fulfill. It's just a collection of moments. It's days, weeks, and months, and years filled with moments. And and what we need to be about is to grab every moment we can. So a friend of mine bought me a plaque that, that captured that, and it says, we do not remember days, we remember moments. And, and that's on my bookshelf, and it, it was for the last two years. I love and, that. And, and it's really true. If you analyze the, the points in your life that, that stick out to you, they're always – Simple moments. 
and and of course they're contained within a day, but it's the moment you remember. Mm -hmm. And so we all have those. They can be big moments like getting to to see the Grand Canyon uh, or a, a child's being born, or they can be small, relatively insignificant moments when you're just having a deep conversation with a friend or a group of friends or your partner, and you look at each other and you realize this is this is a beautiful moment. The sunset is beautiful. The stars are out. We're having a, a, a nice drink here. The conversation was rich. We cried a little. We laughed a little. And if we could just stop and pause for just a second and say, wow, this was a beautiful moment. And I've been talking about that now for the last few months. And my friends and people on the podcast are saying that it's really resonating with them. And they're beginning to look at life differently. And and they're they're they're, they'll call me or they'll text me or they'll send me a Facebook message and say, Dave, Dave, we had a moment. I want to tell you about it. And it's really, it's really been pretty awesome to be honest with you. Well, that is awesome. I always thought, or, or what I always thought in the past couple of years, as I've obsessed over death because of uh, right. finally waking up to that reality. Um, one of the things that I've always thought is, you know, on my deathbed, what do I want to be thinking about? And and I right. would, I want to be thinking about not what's coming or what's on the other side of what's about to happen, but just all the things that I was able to do, all the people I was able to touch, all the things that all the those moments that, that you talked about. You know, um, I would rather spend money on moments and not material things. Exactly. Because that's what's going to that's what you're going to remember. There's yeah. a there's a closing line of a poem that someone sent me recently called "Death." My soul has a hat. If, if you if your listeners want to look it up, it's a Brazilian poet. I think in the 40s or 50s, or it may be more recent than that. Anyway, it's called "My Soul Has a Hat," and the closing line says this: "It says, um, we we have two lives, and the second one begins when we realize we only have one." Oh wow. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that is awesome. And it captures the essence of what I'm talking about. So, and what we're talking about. When we, when you wake up to the fact that this life is what we have, then you really, you really need to be about focusing on what's important. And I've told my friends and other people that, in, in, in a weird way, I consider my diagnosis to be a gift. Because the reality is we all know we're going to die. Sure. And we like to not think about it. We like to kind of put it in the back of our minds. And we go about our lives and we drift through them. And we do the days and the weeks and the months. And they turn into decades. And then before you know it, you're in your 40s. And then you're in your 50s and 60s and 70s. And you've done some things and haven't done some things. You've had some good things and some bad things. And then at some point, you come to the end of it. And, and it just kind of stuff slips by. And you start thinking about, wow, I never did that, or I wish I'd done that, or I wish I'd have said this to that person. And, you know, and and it with me, I get this little glimpse into the window of my ending that most of us don't get. So I'm able to peel away all the unimportant things, all the peripheral things, and focus on moments and look for them and find them and cherish them and and you guys who have to deal with responsibilities and schedules and <laughs> Trump and everything else, <laughs> you guys can't really do that because yeah. you've got life to live and life is full of this, the, the stuff we have to do. I know yeah. that. Yeah. I realize that we, we can't all just retire and travel. And so it's kind of a gift that I have to be able to focus on that in ways that I wouldn't have before. That is a beautiful point. It really just shows the, the yin and yang, the life, the, you know, there's a positive and negative to most things, not you know, very few things in life are all positive or all negative. Very few. And, You're right. And, uh, uh, much of life is what you make it. And, um, you could take this diagnosis and you could sit down, say it's over and just let the, the, the last days go by or you yeah. can make the most of them. And why, yeah. would, why would anyone not want to make the most of them if they really well, thought about it? Well, that's what I think. I think you I, you hit it, man. That's I've had people telling me, yeah, Dave, you're, I, I can't believe how you're handling this. This is great. I don't think I'd be able to do it. And I look at them and say, yeah, you would. Yeah. What else would you do? You, you're just going to lay on your bed and wait for the symptoms to get worse until you can't do anything. And then 
then you get worse and worse and then you die. Of yeah. course you do all you could do. Yeah. You're going to ro- rock every minute. Rock yeah. it, man. Yeah. Live it to the fullest. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there's no, there's really, I guess at a point too, you, your uh, risk aversion is gone to some extent, you know? Uh, oh, why not? <laughs> really fearless now. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I, I think, Oh, that can be good and bad, but I, you know, there's an extreme in anything, but really I don't, I don't hesitate much about anything anymore. And, and if, if I feel like it's somewhere I want to go and something I want to do, if I have got the money to do it, I'm going to do it. Yeah. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to do the stuff I can do while I can do it because this disease renders you more and more incapable. And at some points you, you lose the ability to do this and the ability to do that. And, and you got to do what you can do while you can do it. Yeah. And it's really a good metaphor, I guess, on, on a level for all of us. I mean, you know, nobody gets out of this alive <laughs> and, and uh, we're all going to hit uh, points of diminishing returns in our lives. So while you have the ability, what are you waiting for? I mean, really, what nothing is guaranteed. So, um, yeah, you might as well do all you can. Um, I know that I know that. um you have a really good outlook on it. Has there been, I mean, so what are the, uh, are there, okay. What are the struggles? There have to be struggles to some, some degree. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there are. I, this is a good illustration here. I was, I went out to Southern California last week and, uh, I don't know if, you know, people can Google ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. There's a lot of information out there. And it's essentially, um, it's a disease that affects the ability of the nerves to communicate with the muscles. So your muscles begin to, you, you lose muscle strength. Mine started in my fingers and hands and arms. And some people, it starts in their feet. Some people it starts in their tongue, but it eventually goes to those places regardless of where it starts. So um, you lose the ability to talk and swallow. You lose the ability to walk. Um, your muscles begin to just atrophy. And, and, and so the muscles you do have, have to work that much harder to do normal things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so traveling becomes exhausting. Um, just lifting suitcases, walking around, holding things, pulling a, a little thing like pulling a credit card out of a credit card slot. You would never think in a hundred years that'd be a challenge, but it is for me. Wow. Yeah. So traveling out to LA, I was going out there to do a podcast and to meet some friends and just spend some time looking at the ocean because I love the ocean. And um, so I had this long day of travel, got to the airport here in Nashville about eight in the morning and, and, you know, had a long flight to L.A. And there was some delays, of course, because you're flying. And then I had to get a rental car traveling by myself. And, you know, that's becoming more challenging, but I wanted to do it. So I was getting my rental car at the Thrifty, a long line there. And then I worked at this kiosk trying to do a video thing with the with the person there and they're telling me how to do it and I'm having trouble getting my credit card out I'm, I'm exhausted I'm hungry I'm thirsty I finally get my car I spill my water in my lap I'm, I can't find my directions my uh, phone won't plug into the thing you know just frustrations of life and I'm I'm exhausted and frustrated I'm trying to drive to my hotel and and I'm just you know just dealing with all of that and then I come around the corner and there is the Pacific Ocean and I just, I just thought, oh, I just breathed out. Hmm. And I, I was in an hour of traffic in LA, but I didn't care because I was looking at the ocean. And I, I thought, okay, there's my moment. There it is. I got it. I had to fight through all this stuff and deal with my, my failing body and being exhausted. But there's my moment. And I thought, okay. I will continue to fight through the exhaustion and the frustration of this disease so that I can have moments like that because they're worth it. They're that, they're that beautiful Mm -hmm. and life is that precious. And so that's an example of how it's affecting me on a regular basis. That's a, that is very inspiring. As you were talking, it was just hitting me. Um, I, I don't know you, but, uh, just looking at your life as you described it to me, the word, you know, courage just comes up because you've not been afraid in your life to take big leaps when you need to. 
Um, you know, even though maybe the maybe the first one at eighteen into the Jesus the Jesus yeah uh, oops, freaks, oops, may, may, oops. May, yeah maybe you made you made a slight mistake on that one, but, but you well, know you know as with all of us we all we're all just doing the best we can of course, at the time of course and that's that's you know when you look back and I've had oh my god have I had regrets For sure but. I still look back and I say, okay, Dave, you were doing what you thought was best. At Absolutely. The time. And that's, that's all we can do, man. The, the, I found a quote that really helped me with, with the concept of acceptance and it's acceptance is letting go of the hope that it could have been any different. Exactly. That's oh, beautiful. And when, oh. when you can let go of that hope, you know, it, it just is what it is. Everyone was doing the best they could exactly. with their best intent. Nobody had anything malicious in their heart. And sometimes things work and sometimes things don't. Yeah. If I, um, if I had jumped into that, I might have jumped into Jehovah's Witness. Who knows? That, yeah, really, <laughs> really. Um, and, you know, through all of that, though, your courage has been on display. You're not afraid to to do a thing. Yeah, and, no, I'm really not. Yeah. And I, I just think that's awesome. You know, it's, Thank it's, you, man. It's, I appreciate that. That's something that I think all of us uh, need to, to have – probably more of, or at least appreciate in ourselves. You know, sometimes we, we overlook that and don't see it in ourselves, but uh, it takes a lot of courage for anybody well, to leave a religion or to make those big changes, and, face down their demons. And your listeners, no doubt, have, have, have encountered that as well. If they've left a religion like that and been shunned because of it or had to make changes like that, it, it, it takes an incredible amount of courage to do that. Absolutely. Um, and then... <laughs> You know, it it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. No, uh, God, no. You know, it's, uh, if it was easy, then it wouldn't be courageous. So exactly, you know, yeah. Um, that's just part of it. So um, you have a book, I understand. Uh, working on it. It's oh, you're a working work in on progress. It. Okay. Right. I'm, I've been. I was. I've actually been working on a book for um, a year or so. It's about a third of the way through, I think. I've got a co-writer. She's a friend of mine who teaches English and creative writing and she's collaborating with me on it. And <laughs> when I got this diagnosis a couple months ago, I called her and said, well, we've got a heck of a surprise ending for this book. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you got to laugh at it. Though, yeah, you, know? you do. man. <laughs> oh, I do. I play the LS card all the time. I'll never buy another drink. I tell my friend, I said, you're not going to let a dying man buy this drink, are you? <laughs> of course they're not. <laughs> Uh, again, the yin and yang of life. <laughs> yeah, I'll never pay another parking ticket. <laughs> so, what are your what kind of dreams do you have for this last time? Like, what 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 gets you excited? Uh, you know what? It's just it's it's the big things and the simple things. It's it's I'm I'm going to Italy next month. Uh, let's see, and I'll leave the end of this month um, for a trip with a couple of friends and meeting some other friends over there. Um, I'll be in New York City to see my son and his wife in a couple of year, a couple of weeks. Um, he, he, they never bought into, into, they weren't in the cult. They were there, but they got out. Or he, oh, okay. he got yeah. out. He met his wife at, at college, so they've been good with me all along. Um, I've, I've got a girlfriend that I really love spending time with, and she makes me very happy. And she's really crawling into this thing with me, and is not flinching or running from it, and that's. I, I look forward to all the time I spend with her and um, just simple things like hanging out with my friends. It's just, it's, it's the life is full of beautiful moments. If we just pause and relish them and, and mark them, you know, call attention to them. Yeah. No, and it's, it's just that simple, man. Yeah. And not, not to, to beat the atheist versus Christian drum, but um, you know, a lot of times when I'm talking to people and they, of course, now they're worried when people hear my story, they're like, Oh, you know, where are you now? And if I tell them I'm an atheist, they're worried for my soul. But, um, one yeah. of the things that I hear a lot is, well, you know, doesn't life has no meaning then, you know, or, or what's your purpose in life then? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, man, life has more meaning now because, exactly, because it's more precious. Yeah. Every day matters. I just got something that is far more rare. And, uh, you know, this, this life, uh, we all have one, but not all of us live it. And uh, oh, that's so true. And yeah, uh, that, that whole, that whole thing about life has no meaning then is just ridiculous to yeah. me there that, that, that makes no sense when people say that to me. I said, hey, life has meaning every day. Yeah. There's, there's, there's beautiful meaning in a sunset. Just yeah. soak it in, man. Why do you need more than that? 
And in fact, I tell people about eternal life, you know, and they say, what, you think that's the end? There's no eternity? I said, yeah. And, and by the way, why isn't that enough? Why isn't this life enough? Yeah. Are you that greedy that you need something for eternity? Yeah. If you think about it in life, the, the things that are the most rare are the most valuable. Exactly. If they weren't rare, they didn't have no value. Right. Right. So there's something to be said for limitations on things. <laughs> you know, in, in eternity um, may not be the best, to be quite honest. Oh, yeah. Think of the best thing you like, the most, the, the, the <laughs> one most wonderful thing in the world. If you did it for the rest of eternity, it would be awful. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> what did they say? If you eat enough, I've just heard the the phrase, if you eat enough lobster, it tastes like soap or something like that. Um, exactly. The fact that it's rare makes it valuable. Yeah. It makes it precious. Yep. You don't get to have it every day. And you have this, you have this rare opportunity. Unfortunately, there is, it's not all good, but you have this opportunity, this, this chance to see your life in a, in a new light and to, to make the most of it. And I, I think it's a beautiful thing that you're, you're taking that opportunity to do that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you would like to leave anybody with? Um, any of the listening audience, anyone who's shunned, any words of wisdom or just words well, on life? Uh, I, I've said a lot, enough of what I would consider words of wisdom so they can pick from that. But um, if anyone wants to contact me, I love hearing from people uh, for whatever, you know, uh, Marie, who, who reached out to you, mm -hmm. she's got all my contact info in terms of email, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. Um, and so I'm, I'm doing a lot of traveling in, in upcoming months to do speaking at different um, uh, community groups and events. And I'm just talking about dying out loud. And, and you know, it's, it's nothing to be afraid of, people. It's okay. It's all going to be okay. You know, we're all going to die. But the focus is how you live it. Yeah. You know, when people say you're afraid to die, I say, no, I'm not, I'm not afraid to die. I'm just afraid of not living. Yes. Yeah, that's you should be more afraid of not living than dying. Exactly. Yeah. They've yeah. always said, you know, at the end of the day, we don't regret the things we did, we regret the things we didn't do. Yep. Absolutely. And I love the name Dying Out Loud. That's just yeah. <laughs> that's a badass name. You know, <laughs> really. I mean, you're taking you're taking um the bull by the horns there, you know, you're claiming it as your own. And I I, I think that's awesome. That's um, great, man. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I have truly enjoyed getting to to talk to you. Um, Me too. I I um, send my condolences for the diagnosis, but I am also um, you know give you give you hugs for that, and I'll give you a high five for how you're you're reacting to it all because you're really making something beautiful out of this, and I, I think that's great. And you know you're going to help people through what you're doing now for you know years and years to come you know i just putting yourself out on podcasts or just talking about this you know for years and years people are going to be able to listen to this and going to be inspired to find their own moments in life and to you know to live my moment um, that's great and yeah. I, I think that's that's one of the be most beautiful legacies you can leave yeah I, I agree with that mike i appreciate you saying that that's really something i've I've um, embraced uh, uh, my sister Marie, who reached out to you. She just took it on herself and said, "Dave, we need to get you in front of as many people as possible." And at first, I thought, ah, "You know, really, people want to hear about dying." And then the more I thought about it, the more I realized exactly what you're saying. That yeah, this is this is a way I can say some stuff that's really important and leave it out there. And somewhere along the line, it may really help someone gr grapple with some issues they're dealing with. So yeah, it's. I appreciate the opportunity every time I get to do it. I'm doing as many as I can and as often as I can. Yeah, you're talking about the thing that nobody wants to talk about. Exactly. <laughs> you and know? we're all afraid of it. And we yeah. don't need to be afraid of it. No. You know, just, yeah, I appreciate it, man. I really just can't express how excited I was when the opportunity arose to interview Dave. I knew that he'd have some unique perspectives to share. And, of course, he didn't disappoint there. Um and, you know, I just really enjoyed getting to meet him as a person, uh, just a, a really cool guy. And like I said there near the end of the interview, obviously none of us wishes this diagnosis on anyone. Uh, but at the same time, I hope we all walk away inspired by his courage in facing this and in making the most of the time that he has. 
In fact, I hope we can all live, look at our own lives and maybe see where we can make improvements in our use of time. They've mentioned a poem called My Soul Has a Hat by Mario de Andrade, or Andrade, or probably something fancier than what I'm saying. Anyway, um, this poem, um, I found it online and I wanted to take a second and read it to you. It says, I counted my years and realized that I have less time to live by than I have lived so far. I feel like a child who won a pack of candies. At first, he ate them with pleasure, but when he realized that there was little left, he began to taste them intensely. I have no time for endless meetings where the statutes, rules, procedures, and internal regulations are discussed, knowing that nothing will be done. I no longer have the patience to stand absurd people who, despite their chronological age, have not grown up. My time is too short. I want the essence. My spirit is in a hurry. I do not have much candy in the package anymore. I want to live next to humans, very realistic people who know how to laugh at their mistakes and who are not inflated by their own triumphs and who take responsibility for their actions. In this way, human dignity is defended and we live in truth and honesty. It is the essentials that make life useful. I want to surround myself with people who know how to touch the hearts of those whom hard strokes of life have learned to grow with sweetest touches of the soul. Yes, I'm in a hurry. I'm in a hurry to live with the intensity that only maturity can give. I do not intend to waste any of the remaining desserts. I'm sure that they will be exquisite, much more than those eaten so far. My goal is to reach the end satisfied and at peace with my loved ones and my conscience. We have two lives, and the second begins when you realize you only have one. So I think that, you know, like Dave said, that last line kind of says it all. We have two lives, and the second begins when you realize that you only have one. I know for myself, when I woke up to the realization that, uh, that this life is finite, that nobody gets out of here alive, it was, it was a realization that, that made me appreciate uh, the life that I have now, the, the days that I have, it made me appreciate those things all the more. And, and I really hope that, uh, that we can all walk away with this, determined to, to live a better story with the days that we have left. Dave wanted me to share his contact information with everybody, um, so I'm going to put that in the show notes. And he's a really genuine guy, so I'm sure he'd love to hear from supportive people. Oh, yeah, I want to give a special shout out to the uh, Everyone's Agnostic podcast. Um, highly recommend the show if, if that's a subject matter that interests you. But uh, Marie from the show was the person that initially reached out to me regarding Dave and his story. And uh, Cass, the other uh, co-host, uh, actually is the one who helped me to record him and helped him set him up with the uh, the studio on his end. So um, I just really wanted to to thank them for that and I uh, recommend their podcast, and also uh, when you're looking for the information to contact Dave, um, it's going to be a link to their website uh, where they have a lot of really great information about Dave and things that Dave's doing and where Dave's going to be, and so uh, I just really hope that that's a helpful resource to everybody. Uh, go to shunpodcast.com if you'd like to leave a message of support for Dave and to find the resources mentioned or to pick up a t-shirt or a hoodie, uh, things that you can do to support the show. You can also send me an email there, or you can even leave a voicemail that I can include on an episode. So you can ask a question live if you like, or, or make a recommendation, or whatever the case may be. Follow us at Shun Podcast on YouTube, Instagram, or Twitter. You can also join the Shun Podcast Facebook group and get into interesting conversations there in a supportive environment. If you'd like to hear my story, you can do so on the podcast called This JW Life. And there are two ways that you can support the podcast, um, and not just the podcast, but really all the work I'm doing, whether it's the Facebook group, the emailing back and forth with people, just everything that I do. If you appreciate the podcast and it's helping you in some way, you can help by supporting it financially at patreon.com slash shunned. And today I'm announcing for the first time that I've got uh, some rewards up for supporters. So if you're new, you'll be in the mix, and if you've been supporting for some time, I'll be reaching out to you. Uh, you know, I often refer to the Panda Paradise, a throwback to the 
the life in a peaceful new world track that we folded a million times as, as J-dubs to put in people's doors. Um, you know, we may not make it to the, the panda paradise, but you can now have your own custom plush panda made wearing a shun t-shirt for those that support my work at the $10 monthly level. I'm also putting together a monthly online Apostle Fest, your opportunity to meet with me and others on a video chat each month, and we're going to do that at the $20 monthly level. Again, I'll be reaching out and arranging that soon to those who, uh, who've been supporting for some time, and I appreciate their support even when there wasn't you know, these, these rewards, just their appreciation for my work. But um, if you sign up, then I'll be, uh, as a new patron, I'll be reaching out to you as well, and we're going to get these things um, arranged. Uh, again, just go to patreon.com slash shunned, and you'll see the details right there. Supporting the Patreon uh, helps me to keep this going at, the, at this rate. It, it means the world to me. I'll shout you out here if you sign up. In fact, uh, I need, have a few people I need to shout out right now. So, again, it's always first names because I don't know the situation of everyone and, and don't want to out anybody. But I, uh, I want to give a big thank you to Tiffany, Cassie, Jenny, Emily, Tamara, and Dana. So, Tiffany, Cassie, Cassie Jenny, Emily, Tamara and Dana, thank you so much for stepping up to support what I'm doing with the podcast and everything else. Um, I really appreciate you taking your time to sign up to help me keep going. And it really encourages me and just makes the time and monetary expense of this easier. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, another way to support this is to leave a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts uh, for both Shunned or This JW Life. doesn't cost you a dime, but it really helps other people to find the show. I also offer both individual and group coaching programs to help people get past their past, uh, to help people find themselves today, and to help people get unstuck so that uh, they can have life after whatever cult they, they're leaving. If you'd like to work with me individually or in a group, I am a certified life coach and I want to help. So go to shunpodcast.com slash coaching and you'll find the information that you need. So we're going to close out this episode, as we always do, with the song No Hell Yet by Fair Voyeur. You can find a link to her song, to the Patreon page for the show, to resources mentioned and more, not just on the website, but if you're listening on a podcast app, you can probably get it all in the app description um, if you look there. So as we end all episodes, love others, do no harm, and go be happy. Curse God and die.